Thanks to Brilliant for supporting this SciShow Shorts compilation video. To keep building your STEM skills beyond this video, check out brilliant.org slash scishow. That link will give you 20% off an annual premium subscription. Here on SciShow, we make a lot of videos, and sometimes those videos are compilations of clips from our favorite videos that you might have missed. For example, today we've whipped up a compilation of clips all about food, an appetizer sampler, if you will. These bite-sized clips all come from the short section of our channel, which is a thing now. So if you like what you see, you can check out other ones of those. And please let our chefs know how they did in the comment section. With that, I will leave it to our short-form hosts, me, Savannah, Neba, and Alexis. Take it away, us! Hello, it's Hank. I'm here to tell you how to stop your apple slices from turning brown, because that is a thing that you can do with science. So browning happens because of an enzyme in produce called polyphenol oxidase. It reacts with compounds, including oxygen, and ultimately leads to the formation of brown pigments. And that means all you have to do to stop browning is to deactivate or block that enzyme. And enzymes are just proteins, and you can change them in all kinds of ways, by heating them up or by cooling them down, or by making them more or less acidic. So an easy way to do this is with lemon juice, which deactivates the enzyme by being super acidic. If you don't want the lemon flavor, apple juice will also do the job, just not as well, because it's not as acidic as lemon juice. And then there's a real wild card, salt water, which isn't acidic, but studies suggest that the salt in the salt water binds to something that ultimately stopped the enzyme from working. It's an ongoing question. We're trying to figure it out. But now you know, no more brown with the help of science. Happy snacking. Pumpkins, my favorite fall fruit. That's right, pumpkins are a fruit. As far as botanists are concerned, the distinction between fruit and vegetable is anatomical. Fruits are, by definition, the mature, ripened ovary of a plant. That's where eggs are made and fertilized so they can develop into seeds. So if your vegetable contains at least one seed, you've actually got a fruit. As you can see, this here pumpkin is full of seeds. So it is, without a doubt, a fruit. So are all of these. I know. I am sorry. I don't make the rules. Go take it up with a botanist. Here's a trick to pick better fruit. Choose the ones with light speckles on them. In fruit like dates and nectarines, those spots are areas with higher concentrations of sugar. A publication in the European Journal of Horticultural Science suggests these light spots are more sugary because there's leftover carbs, or sugars, when the process of making the pigment isn't completed. The authors also suggest that these spots appear where the fruit has, like, sweat a lot. So since the fruit has sugar and water in it, but transpiration lets some of that water escape, that remaining sugar ends up being more concentrated. Got a tomato in your fridge? Get it out of there! According to research, sticking a tomato in the fridge stops it from making a lot of the key compounds that make it smell. And without those aroma compounds, tomatoes just taste way worse, because flavor is just as much about your sense of smell as it is your sense of taste. And I know what you're thinking, but no, this doesn't just happen while the tomato ripens. It keeps making these delicious smells even after it's fully ripe. So don't even think about refrigerating it to keep it from spoiling. It will still taste worse. You just gotta eat them while they're good. Mangoes can act like poison ivy. Their skin has a toxin in it called urushiol, which is the same thing that makes poison ivy dangerous. So whether your body treats mangoes as toxic or not could hinge on whether you've ever touched poison ivy before. If you're exposed to ivy first, you are more likely to be allergic to mangoes because your body already recognizes urushiol as a threat. But it only works in that order, probably because urushiol is found in the entire ivy plant, while it's mainly found in the mango peel leaves and stem. So handling a mango first isn't likely to trigger that immunity response because you're probably not handling the other parts of the mango like the stem. Researchers created a way to measure radiation exposure in units of mushroom sandwiches, as in if you're foraging somewhere in Sweden for instance, maybe avoid having more than half a wild mushroom sandwich per day. In 1986, Chernobyl's radioactive fallout covered a lot of Sweden, including the edible mushrooms growing there, and those radioactive substances still affect the plant and animal life today. In one study, teen citizen scientists collected mushrooms to test their radioactivity, and to put the amount of radioactive contamination in the different mushrooms into context, researchers created the Mushroom Sandwich Index, or like how much you'd have to eat in a year to go above of permissible radiation levels. In places with more fallout, mushroom radiation was generally higher than normal. But only two samples had higher radiation than what the Swedish government allows in mushrooms being sold. So thanks to citizen scientists, we know Swedish mushrooms still hold the effects of an event from years ago in a completely different country. Chicken soup is medicine, and there might be actual science behind that. Maybe this is something your caregiver gave you to make you feel better, but does it work or is it just an old wives tale? Well, scientists actually tested this by giving folks hot water and then actual chicken soup and then measured how fast their mucus moved, which they measured by sticking a camera up their noses and then seeing in a display the movement 
of the mucus. They found that hot liquids help loosen up the mucus so you can breathe more easily, which is no surprise since the steam rising gets in your nose and then literally wets the mucus and then runnier mucus is easier to clear out. But researchers think that the soup has an extra component in the aroma that might make the mucus move even faster. Wild. You know how people like train pigs to go find truffles? It doesn't seem very efficient, but we do it because growing truffles is complicated. See, truffles are prized by foodies everywhere, partly because they're ridiculously rare. They grow underground in these mutually beneficial symbiotic relationships with tree roots, usually of hardwoods like oaks. And then people train dogs and pigs to go sniff them out in the wild. The soil conditions also have to be just right for the symbiosis to happen. Now, you still can try to farm them, but uh, if you plant the trees, it will take a hot decade or so for them to be mature enough to grow truffles. That said, many wild truffle habitats are also threatened by climate change. Change. So we might just have to learn how to farm them if we want to keep enjoying those truffle fries. I have heard a number of times people say that science says you should salt your pasta water because it'll make your pasta cook faster. Weirdly enough, this is one of those ideas that is actually both true and false. See, adding a solute like salt to a solvent like water can change the properties of that water. Properties like boiling and freezing points. And yes, adding salt to water makes it boil at a hotter temperature, which would cook your pasta faster. But it turns out you need a lot of salt to make that happen, way more than you are going to use. Adding the amount of salt that a nearby box of pasta told me I should add would only increase the boiling temperature by like 0.05 degrees Celsius, which is way less than just like going up or down in elevation. This is not going to result in a noticeable difference in cooking time. You should, however, salt your pasta water. Why? Well, for the same reason we salt all the other things, it tastes good. If you pick greasy, crunchy, salty fries over a salad, you chose what your brain evolved to choose. And that's because the human brain is pretty big compared to our ancestors. So powering it takes a lot of energy. To keep up, we've evolved to prefer energy-rich, calorie-dense foods like fries more than foods like lettuce, which don't offer as much energy. And a new study points out that when we look at energy-rich foods like fries, our brains anticipate that the food will probably be super tasty. And our brains estimate how tasty the food will be faster than other information about the food. Because taste is more of a concrete factor while other things like healthfulness involve considering multiple aspects of the food that take longer for our brain to process. So our brains do a lot behind the scenes to help us make choices. Like, what meals seem the tastiest? Talking about all of that food has made me hungry enough to whip up my own set of tapas. But preparing food often requires an understanding of how to multitask. In the brilliant course about computer science fundamentals, Pierre the Baker can show you how to use parallelism to get lots of things done at once in the kitchen. You don't even need to be a baker or a computer scientist to take this course. It's designed for high school and college students who want to learn the tools, problem-solving techniques, and algorithmic thinking behind computer science in a fun way. And there's no coding required required so you're not daydreaming in lecture hall or staring blankly at a command line. Like the baking example, Brilliant makes their courses interactive and applicable to your daily life. To try it out for free, click the link down in the description below or visit brilliant.org slash scishow. That link will give you 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video.